Well, welcome to a new Harry's Garage video. And today's car is quite different from the normal cars I have in the garage because it's the Jeep Cherokee. And this particular one is the Wagoner Limited version of the Jeep Cherokee, which I'll go into detail in a moment. Now, the reason I've got this in is because recently I put a BMW X5 review out, sort of claiming it was the first SUV of uh, real note. And quite a few uh, of my American viewers wrote in and said, hmm, Jeep Cherokee could potentially claim to be the first SUV. And having done a bit of research, there was a fascinating history behind this car. And I can't wait to tell the story because this was launched as the sports wagon. This arrived in the market 83, 84 in America. Um, didn't arrive in the UK until 93. And it was a complete change from what Jeep were doing before. This is known as the XJ series of Cherokee. There was the SJ before it. And the change was extraordinary because it basically shrunk the car. This has a unibody construction instead of having a separate chassis. And then I dug a bit more about the deal because it was actually AMC who developed this. I didn't realize that it wasn't a Chrysler developed car in the very early days. It was an AMC um, car. And AMC had bought Jeep in 1970. Where's my crib sheet? 1970, they'd bought the Jeep brand. And Renault had bought into AMC in where they had 22% in 1979. This the design of this started in 78. So it was a European flavor because Renault were involved in the development of this car as well. Couldn't believe the backstory about this car. And so I thought it was well worth a feature uh, and what this car meant. So let's go have a closer look. Now the key difference with this car when it arrived was the size of it. It has really shrunk. The SJ that came bef was before it was 31 inches longer than this um, and this shrunk it down but the interior space was 90 percent of what that car offered they'd done a fantastic packaging job uh, on this car it was a four liter straight six engine in this one it was actually the original designs it, it was two door and then they went to four door a bit like the um, land rover discovery and I just think it's a very elegant, boxy design. It's, um, it does what it says on the tin. Also love how it came with this as well, um, the, the rack and the, the, the rails on top. And this particular example, as I said, is the Wagoneer Limited. And that makes it extra special because that is like the ultimate spec in Cherokee land and with Wagoneer Limited, you lost the Cherokee badges, you got um, stepped headlights at the front, and you got this extremely distinctive wood veneer trim down the side of your car, and there's lever and there's Limited on the seats. And I just love the backstory to this actual example of car, because this car was originally ordered by a very enterprising car enthusiast in the UK, who also had a lovely ski chalet in San Moritz and he wanted something to go around in San Moritz and when this car was launched in the um, late 80s he said that's the car I want at my ski chalet and ordered it up via Bramley um, back in the 80s and it was basically the very first example to come to Europe how cool is that to actually have this at San Ritz? It gets even better, the story, because apparently it was an underground garage and next part next to this was his Monteverdi coupe for summer motoring. And he had a um, friend who used to visit him quite often in his Porsche 959. Quite a garage, so there's a real story about this car. And that's why I actually wanted to feature this one rather than just a regular Cherokee. So this is actually a 1988 car um, I love the original stickers, Bramley stickers in the back. I'm not sure if that's the original plate, but it says Bramley in the back. Um, it's an 89 model year. Wood continues, Wagoneer, um, nicely trimmed in the back as well. And a flip down seat as well. So there's plenty of space in the back. So is it, yeah, it's reasonable about a practicality of this car. I'm told that is um, a plastic reinforced plastic fiberglass type tailgate rather than metal. All oh, this is metal. Uh, in the back, there's a little bench seat. Yeah, it's a bit shrunken in the back. There are no headrests. And there's, in this example, there's only lap belts. Um, I think by the time it came to the UK, it had proper seat belts in it. But the whole thing about this car, it was so much lighter than the previous generation of car. 
in, in the UK, this is caught competing with, um, well, I suppose Range Rover and also the Discovery. And they're tipping the wrong side of two tonnes. I weighed this car earlier. 1558 kilos this car weighs is about half a ton lighter than the comparative SUVs of its day okay it's, it's a little shrunken but the interior space isn't at all bad and that then means it's got pretty good performance so I've dug out done my usual trick of digging out some old car magazines and um, who, who's this one uh, Autocar um, they figured this car and here we go um, cries a four litre limited um, it did nine and a half to 60, 8.8 .8 seconds, 30 to 50. That sort of performance is way above a regular SUV. That puts it in line with a, a 320i touring, something like that. Way quicker than Discovery. I think they have tested a Discovery in here. And uh, yeah, the V8 petrol did 13.4, 13 to 70. So five seconds slower, completely different sort of benchmark. Now I've got this car magazine, so this is June 95, and I love their sort of summary of the Cherokee. Um, they say, uh, four, car like at a price you like against older than its owners think, sum up, glitzy, pacey, and proud of it. Because this was an American icon. Uh, when this came to the UK, they really sold extremely well. I can remember looking at these and it was a real temptation. I didn't actually go for one because I needed the towing capacity over the, um, with the Range Rover. We were farming and we quite often did three and a half tons behind and these are about 2.3 ton towing capacity or something like that, basically because they're a lighter weight car. But they were cheap-ish for what they were. Um, they, this was priced a four litre SE, 23,595 when this came in. If I look at what a Range Rover was, a 4.6 HSE, same sort of performance, was £43,950. So nearly twice the price, or well, this is a half price Range Rover, think of it like that. Um, Discovery was also out at the same time. And if I wanted one of those, well, it was sort of an ES was 27,375. But that was much slower and wallowy and didn't handle like one of these at all. And these had, Jeep were renowned for reliability. And this four litre lump is basically unburstable automatic gearbox. They had a great reputation. They came with great warranties. Anyway, I'm gonna take it outside now. We can't go for a full drive because we're still in this lockdown situation, but just around the farm, just give you a better idea what this car is all about. Oh, and oh that annoying sound when you leave the key in the ignition. It's, loud and proud in this car. Um, so what you met with? Well, you met with a very American-esque dashboard, switch gear, etc. It's all what I'd expect to see in this vintage of Jeep. Um, all very simple, all toys, um, which you didn't really get on the UK cars at the time. I've got uh, cruise, cruise control here as well. I've got all electric windows, locking rear windows or central locking is on here as well. I can do that. Um, adjustable wheel, funny little lever here, I can do that. Cruise control, air conditioning, stereo, etc. Um, so yeah, all sort of familiar. And a pull out, oh yeah, a pull out light switch that you used to get on um, 911s and things like that. Uh, obviously, six cylinder engine, which you, you can sort of hear, but it's the visibility. Look, I'm right up in the roof. And my immediate thought is, is I'm in a shrunken, roll, um, a shrunken Range Rover. Very typical gear control. It's great big T-bar control for the automatic gearbox. And off you go. First thing you notice as you step off, hey, hang on a minute, I was a bit sharp. And they always were. They just got a bit of a move on quite quickly. Now this is an era, this car is an 88 registered 89 model year car. So no airbags or anything. I just think it's fun. It's actually got the exposed Allen keys on the steering wheel. That was a sort of signature of the Range Rover L322 that they like to put the exposed bolts on it. But here it is on the Jeep in 1980, whatever, when this car 84, 85 came out. So yeah, good to see. Other noticeable thing about it, it's the comfort of it. This is a rubbish bit of road we're on at the moment. Truly rubbish. I try never to record on 
because it's so bumpy. This is pretty good down here, to say the least. And when you look underneath, it's surprising it is because it's, yes, yeah, leaf springs at the back, cores at the front. But yeah, it's great the way it can absorb those bumps. I suppose the taller tyres, the uh, 205, 70 tyres, 15 tyres of the day and age, they help as well. But yeah, a really comfortable ride. Now I'm just going to do my usual sprint up the drive. It's an important thing to do in all said cars. Um, I have a power switch on the gearbox, on the transmission, on the dash. So I'll add power and I will just stamp on the throttle and see what happens. Ooh. I should add, there we are, 80 clicks. I'm slowing down for the house so I don't get told off and up to the farm. Yeah, after that initial bite, it's, it's okay the performance, but we are 30, 40 years on from when this car was um, first came out. But for an SUV, wow, it's a bit tight. It gets a bit of a move on. Um, so it really changed our perceptions of what an SUV was. Because up until this point, the separate chassis type off-roader, the Range Rover, cruisers, all sorts of things, um, Nissan patrols, they were lumbersome things. They rolled around on corners. Think of that original discovery. Oh my God, oh, it was a giant sail um, in the winds. And it just wasn't a stable. It wasn't made for um, sort of attacking a series of bends or um, even on the motorway. It was just a big car. Not so with this. And this is why everyone who, the initial buyers of this were tempted out of their three series tourings or estate cars of various sorts into this where they could have an SUV with a car S sort of handling feel and the reason it squealed away from the line like that is because actually in normal settings it's two wheel drive um, to get four wheel drive I actually have to pull on the lever down here you can have it four wheel drive all the time if you want but actually in normal mode, it's two-wheel drive, and that sort of added to its appeal as well, because there was that sporty nature of this estate car that was actually two-wheel drive as well. Now, it seems silly not to, while it's here, to take it a little bit off-road round the farm. For another note, look at that turning circle. It's like a mini flipping turning circle. And then, as we go down here, really notice that soft ride again. It handles these sort of bumps no problem at all. And I've got this visibility as well. And it has ability off-road. Remember you know, when I was we were at Evo, um, Jeep used to do these really good off-road events. They had no problems doing um, trails etc. Um, and you do these proper two, three day events properly off-road uh, with Jeep. They take it very ser seriously. It's in their DNA. I should have done the full I can do on the flight. I can go to part-time four-wheel drive or four-wheel drive as you're driving along, which is a nice feature as well, using the yeah, separate hand. There's no such thing of sort of adjustable ride height and that sort of thing. That was all Range Rover. Um, stuff to vary the height but as I say everything's tucked away on this it's such a good design and that wheels at each corner mean that I can just disappear off into deep holes without any thought of hitting anything outside in fact it just feels completely at home down here but while we're down here the one thing I'll always do when I bring an off-roader down here is a bit of a hill test a bit unfair on this because it's not on uh, any sort of tyres that have off-road ability. It's got normal mud and snow uh, tyres, etc. So here is the hill in question. Proper steep, grass, everything against this car. Can it, can it set off? Right, I'm going to stop on the hill here and let's see what happens. I'm quite impressed with that. I am quite impressed. Better than I thought it would be. But the other nice trick with its proper off-road DNA is there is a low gearbox as well. Um, 
so I can do into neutral, I have to do this stationary now, select low speed, and I've got a proper crawler gear. So that's feet off, I don't know what this is, 45 degree slope, so um, yeah, locked in first, and it properly crawls down the hill. Feet off, nothing, nothing touching anything, head down the hill. Mighty impressive, but actually what I would expect from Jeep because they take this sort of stuff seriously. There we go. Now I'm going to select another little gearbox bit of fun in this car because if I put it, if I put it here. I'm in. I'm in two-wheel drive, and I have a field. Be rude. Be rude not to. With such useless tyres, um, as part of the appeal of this is it. It has just a, a sportier gait than other off-road SUVs, really. Um, so that's sort of. I'm just going to put it back. So I'm going to go back up the hill. Yeah, see if it'll, see if we're drifting four-wheel drive as well. Don't want to overdo it, but uh, yeah. I could cope with this. It's just that lack of weight compared to Range Rover thing. There isn't that mass. It's all quite controllable when it starts to get a bit loose. Yeah, impressive bit of kit. You can do off-roading this car. If you hear a few rattles in here, don't worry. I think it's just something in the glove box, which is slightly annoying. But yeah, so how do you summarize this car? What don't I like about it? Well, weirdly, the, the, the size thing, it's a love-hate thing. It's either not big enough, um, and therefore you've got not great rear seats. You don't really want to travel in the rear seat of this thing. Um, and it's, yeah, it's not as big as we expect an SUV to be. Um, they did diesel versions of these uh, for, you know, supposedly better economy in the 90s in the UK. We were just starting the diesel revolution. Uh, but it was a bloody awful diesel V8. It was a brattly four-cylinder diesel. They did a two and a half litre engine for this as well. They just knackered the character of the car, a bit like with early Range Rovers when they did yeah, pretty hopeless four-cylinder engines as well. But the four-litre six-cylinder unit in here works a treat. Um, suits the car. Um, it's what Jeep's all about. Um, so yeah, if you're going to have one, make sure you have the 4 litre, but obviously it doesn't do the miles per gallon that you'd expect. You're going to be 18, 20 mpg or something like that. But actually that's not too bad. Because the weight, again, it's a thing of the weight and the fact it doesn't punch a very big hole in the air. It's a gate closed. I suppose anything else against it well um, they, they went rusty quite quickly if you didn't look after them fortunately this one has had a properly pampered life and it is just lovely from what I can see but um, yeah drivetrains last quite a long time rust is a bit of an issue well, let's go on to the positives and starting the first one it feels like a proper Jeep um, it has that DNA about it, that usability, the off-road ability. I just love the visibility out of it. And it feels like a mini Range Rover. It's the only way to describe it. I don't know how they get the sort of command driving uh, position on a smaller car like this, but they do. And they give you all the advantages of SUV-ness in a much smaller package. It's about a foot shorter than a um, Macan today, and that feels pretty small. Well, this is significantly smaller than a Macan, and it's narrow, and it just works. It works in multi-storey car parks, um, down the little lanes, off-road, etc. And it's obviously got a fantastic turning circle as well. And then there's the design. I wouldn't be brave enough to tick the box to get those wood panels on the side for the Wagoneer limited edition but somehow now it just looks what I wanted a look like Jeep for the outdoors world weird it looks as kitsch as hell but not somehow now it's much more attractive 
and uh, I would actually order it up with that, having seen it and lived with it. So as an icon of the past, I can't get over it. And it just appeals to that out, outdoorsy American life. This is what this car is all about. So I've loved getting to know it again. Um, really quite impressed. I love all the toys on it and I just love what it says about America and in this much smaller package than we generally expect from America. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, please watch Harry's Farm as well as this channel. If you like these videos, well, please subscribe. Keep watching because there'll be some more videos coming along very soon.